Okay then YouTube, let's revise some A-level philosophy. This is the 2022 uh, edition. 2022? Yeah, that's the year we're in, isn't it? Which is a very strange year. The first year that a number of people will have had a chance to do public exams in England. And there's some advanced information. So that's going to be able to tailor how we're revising uh, for AQA A-level philosophy. So let's dive in. Now, if I was doing this in a classroom, I would pause here and invite you to define all of these key terms, which are right at the start of the philosophy specification with one another and then go through them. So uh, if you are in a classroom watching this video, doing this with a teacher, I, I invite you to do that, to pause and go through these terms with each other and then check them through. I'm not actually going to do it all because I think all this is in my epistemology revision video, which is also on YouTube. So I refer you to that. I will also refer to that at further points throughout this video. So we can skip this slide. And similarly, all of this stuff, uh, which is just going to flash up briefly, is on my uh, exam technique in AQA philosophy YouTube video. So I'm not going to go through all of this again because it's very similar to what's in that video that I also refer to you to elsewhere on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. Okay, here we go then. Here's some stuff that's particular to 2022. So here's the uh, new edition of the question guessing table for epistemology this time. In this video, by the way, I'm going to cover epistemology, metaphysics of God and ethics. Sorry, ethics before metaphysics of God. Um, so moral uh, philosophy, purely because I've never studied metaphysics of mind as it happens and never had to teach it in a classroom. So maybe in the future one day I, I will and I'll do videos on that, but I, I can't help you with, with that right now. But I can help you with epistemology, hopefully. So here's what's come up in past years um, for the most recent specification um, for epistemology in, in the most recent years. So can I turn my pointer on on this? Let's have a look. Uh, pointer options, laser pointer, cool. By the magic of technology, here is a floating red dot, which is going to highlight that on the specimen paper, you've got a three marker on skepticism, a five marker on direct realism and the argument from illusion, five marker on idealism and indirect realism, 12 marker on Descartes, that's a bit vague, sorry, and um, a 25 marker on JTB, the tripartite definition of knowledge. Now, it's really the 25 markers that I think we're most interested in, especially this year, because you get the most marks for them, but also because they're the ones that um, are going to be actually weirdly easiest to predict I think I think as ever um, no money back guarantee don't shoot me don't track me down and shoot me if I'm wrong about any of this this is just guesses okay it's, um, mildly informed but maybe not very well informed guesses I have I have been occasionally writing in previous years so for the um, for the advanced information for epistemology basically it's all on there except for innate ideas you don't have you're not going to have anything about innate ideas asked of you in the 2022 exam and idealism there is no idealism on the advanced information for 2022 what is on is the tripartite definition of knowledge direct realism indirect realism and the intuition and deduction thesis oh that also um reminds me that the uh, skepticism um isn't isn't on there either so they're going to be asking about these things um, but if you look at what the essays have been the 25 markers in in previous years we've had idealism well you know that's not going to come up anyway you've had direct realism so they're probably not going to ask an essay question at least phrased in terms of direct realism i'll come back to that they're not going to ask about innate ideas and justified true belief an essay about that is on the specimen paper but aqa have shown us that they're they're more than happy to put 25 markers on papers that are also on the specimen so that means you're basically going to get an essay question on the epistemology paper on justified true belief or direct realism as in probably about perception but phrased in terms of direct realism i think that's less likely but it's not impossible 
or the intuition and deduction thesis, Descartes' ideas about epistemology. My money's on that one. That's my guess. If I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would put money on intuition and deduction thesis coming up uh, because of what's come up before. But we'll see. They could be nice to you because, hey, it's been a pandemic and a global apocalypse has happened and, and so on and give you the same one as on the specimen, justified true belief. Um, but let's see. And I'm going to hopefully in this video help you to prepare for for all of those a little bit. Right. Onwards to more epistemology. Actually, in fact, onwards, but then another footnote. So all of this stuff about epistemology I cover in my epistemology revision uh, video on YouTube. So I'm not going to repeat it all again because actually I was teaching it more recently that year. I haven't taught it um, as it happens um, this year. I've, I've taught uh, multiple exam boards for religious studies this year and um, metaphysics of God. But I, I made that video when I was fresher um, off of teaching epistemology. So I refer you back to the epistemology revision video. You can obviously skip the bits on innate ideas and idealism and global skepticism or skepticism for 2022. Um, but yeah, otherwise that video should hopefully be helpful to you. So I'm going to skip through a few slides now. Oh, wait, am I? Hang on. Sorry, I've just realized something. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to explain all of this definition of knowledge stuff. How I'm however, I'm going to ask you rhetorically, what are you going to do if the essay question on JTB, the tripartite definition of knowledge, comes up in the 2022 paper? Sorry, I've got COVID in the moment, so I'm slurring my words a bit. But hey, this is better than nothing, hopefully. Is this better than nothing? I don't know. Discuss. Discuss. You can decide that for yourself and, and comment um, accordingly. Um, you need to be prepared in case the JTB essay comes up. You need to have something to say, an essay plan up your sleeve. So what are you going to do? Well, here's Dr. Tarasenko's cynical slash blaggers, or maybe cynical blaggers way to write philosophy essays. This isn't an essay plan so much. This is just some tips about writing essays. So I acknowledge, I acknowledge sick formers of the United Kingdom who or England I guess maybe there's some people who do AQA philosophy in Wales I digress tangent um, that writing philosophy essays is hard okay I've heard the cries of the masses from enough students that I've taught analyzing philosophical arguments in an original way and advancing your own case is hard and you certainly need to be able to do the second of those things to score well in a an AQA philosophy exam even if you don't have wildly original things to say because Let's face it, who does? There's nothing new under the sun. Oh, I'm in a bit of a pessimistic mood today. You do need to be able to make your own case about the ideas you've studied. And that can be difficult, I know, because, well, a textbook can tell you the different views, but it can't tell you which one to choose and which one is the best and which one to defend yourself. And if you only juxtapose, that word is in the mark scheme, um, the different views, which means put them next to each other without making them talk to one another, without analysing them in your own voice and making your own argument about what is correct, you will not score well. You have to do that to climb up the grade boundaries in the 25 markers. Trouble is, you might not know what you actually think about the issue. And your teacher might not even know what they think about the issue um, and have just been moderating discussions, trying to get you to come up with your own ideas. You know, the examiner might not even know what they think about the issue, what the definition of knowledge is or so on. So ideally, sixth formers, year 12s and 13s or anyone sitting this early or sitting it late and re repeating a year, you the way to solve this is to actually do philosophy. In an ideal world, the A-level in philosophy would have actually provoked you to do some philosophizing of your own. So having read, thought and discussed about these ideas, you would have come to your own view and then argue for that and defend that because that's actually doing philosophy. Surprise, surprise, that's what philosophy is, thinking about difficult questions that no one agrees on the answers to and coming up with your own answer and being able to defend it. However, if for some reason in this fallen world that may or may not be composed of imperfect copies of the platonic forms, if that hasn't happened in your life and experience and you don't have your own ideas and arguments to defend, here's a very, very cynical suggestion that you could take if you're desperately scrambling to, to work out what to, what positions to defend. You could find out or try and find out an approximation of what the majority of philosophers think. Um, 
and defend that. Or you could just figure out what's a straightforward way to write the essay that you can memorize and then defend that. Because to be honest, my my personal view is that if you actually think something yourself and defend that, you will you will do that best of all. But if, if you if you're not sure, then the examiner is not going to know at the end of the day, are they what you really think in your heart of hearts, in your um, own deep subjective experience, if that was consistent anyway. Um, so why not? Be a bit cynical if you're not sure. So first, to do the first of those things, to find out an approximation of what the majority of philosophers think, why not go to the 2020 Phil Papers Survey of Professional Philosophers? Now, obviously, this comes with a huge footnote, huge caveats. This is this is a very bad way to do philosophy. Find out what the majority view is and then and then argue for that because you know, just because lots of people think something doesn't mean that it's correct. That's an obvious fallacy. It could be the minority that are actually, that are actually thinking correctly and, and sensibly in, in each case and have the right answer. But if we're being cynical, if we're being a, a bit crafty, this is um, a tactic I've suggested to some students who've really uh, been in a struggling position for finding out, well, at least what um, an examiner who probably has some experience of studying philosophy and working with professional philosophers is slightly more likely statistically to think themselves. So you're going to be on their side. Gosh, this is a really terrible way of doing philosophy. Socrates would not approve of this. However, this is just a YouTube video to give you some tips and tricks and suggestions to help you out. So I'll let myself off. Right. So what do the majority of professional philosophers apparently think about the definition of knowledge and, and what knowledge is if JTB works anymore in the face of Gettier and so on. Well, if I was in a classroom, I would, before showing you some thoughts on this, pause this presentation and get you to discuss with your peers what you think about this um, so that your own ideas, to try a, a one last ditch attempt to draw out your own personal views and ideas because the best way to write the, re the essay is to go with that. So if you're in a classroom situation right now, pause my waffling and uh, have a have a chat. What do you think? Um, have a revision discussion of, of this. And whether you've done that or not, unfortunately, to continue, the data, if you survey them and look at um, the, the literature on, on definition of knowledge, the contemporary literature, shows that philosophers are actually hugely divided on this issue. There is not general consensus about what knowledge is and whether JTB still holds up anymore in the face of Gettier, or perhaps at least there's agreement that it doesn't, but how, how best to modify JTB isn't agreed upon by philosophers. And in fact, some very distinguished philosophers actually think that knowledge is indefinable, perhaps following a Wittgensteinian line of thinking, which talks about family resemblance between concepts and how the use determines the meaning and, and, and so on. Um, however, there are a there's a small majority, at least in the Phil Papers survey, as far as I can see, of philosophers that go for reliabilism. So cynically, you could set out to defend reliabilism if this essay comes up comes up if you're not sure what to argue how would you do that well after explaining k equals jtb and what that means and the Gettier problems which you need to do briefly at the start if uh, this comes up as an essay but don't spend too long doing it because remember argue your case don't just give knowledge information say what you think about about the ideas um, then argue for reliabilism perhaps playing it off one or two of the other theories and showing how it is better than them the ones that you think uh, it, it best, um, uh, its, its merits show up best against. All right. Or here's another suggestion that I've seen um, performed very well by some struggling uh, students in, in the past. Another thing you can do is go through all the different views in order that were up two slides ago um, that, I, that I didn't talk through again because it's in a different video. Uh, in the order that they appeared chronologically and analyse their flaws, because then you're telling a bit of a narrative, aren't you, about how it all started with Plato and justified true belief. And then a few thousand years later, Gettier came along and blew that out of the water. And then these other theories have developed. Well, I suppose Descartes predates Gettier, um, so not quite chronological there. But you can do a narrative development of the different theories that try to come up with a way of improving upon justified true belief. And then you can um, explain how they all fall short and the next one along tries to do even better, which is going to mean 
In terms of the AQA specification, you land on virtue epistemology, isn't it? Because that's the last one on the specification and the most recent one of the ones you've have had to study in terms of when it was developed. And then defend that. All right. These are just thumbnail sketches of essays, of course. I may do another video because it's been requested by a few people in a bit more going into a bit more detail about um, suggestions for how to structure 25 mark essays. There, there is some of that in my exam technique video, I believe. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to cram all that into this video, which is already 15 minutes long and could be a lot shorter if I was waffling less. So let's keep going. All right, so here's just a reminder that you need to know about direct realism for this exam because it's on the uh, advanced information. But I go through all di all these points in the epistemology video. So again, I refer you to that. I refer you to that also for the indirect realism stuff. However, what do you do if the perception essay comes up, which I think is unlikely, but it's not impossible. And if it does come up, it's probably going to be phrased in terms of direct realism because it's been phrased in terms of indirect realism before. So actually, uh, let's chop off indirectly here. It, you might get it something like, do we perceive objects directly? Never mind about that or indirectly. If it's going to come up, my guess is it will just talk about the, the directness. Um, so for 25 marks, what do you do? What do you do? Well, uh, how do I, where's my transition gone? There we go. So um, again, if you're doing this in a classroom environment, talk, pause the video, talk about it now. What do you actually think and why? Remind yourselves, see if some views come out that you could defend. And once you've done that, or if not, so one thing we can rule out if we're being cynical and trying to find what the majority view is and then and then go with that to help us sign up to to a, to a, an argument. Um, very few philosophers are idealists in Barclay's sense of idealism about epistemology and perception these days. There's there's not many around. So it would be unusual. And in fact, in my experience of teaching philosophy, very few students end up with idealism because it's quite counterintuitive, isn't it? And Barclay's idealism depends quite heavily on the idea of a god who's linking up all the different minds having ideas and, and perceptions with one another, which is in certain parts of the enlightened European West, unfashionable for some reason these days. So uh, not so many idealists around. Unfortunately, the only other thing the data shows us is that most philosophers are some kind of realists. And in fact, as far as I can tell, and from talking to some professional philosophers, the discussion seems to have moved on from the vocabulary of direct and indirect realism these days. I hear about critical realism and, and things, um, but um, not so much direct indirect. That seems to be a bit of a, a quirk of the AQA philosophy specification that it's still talking in those terms. As far as I can see, I could be completely wrong about that. So philosophers tend to be realists. They tend to think there is an external world. In some um, versions of the debate historically, yes, there has been this contrast between direct and indirect realism. As far as I can see today, um, if you translate the, the discussions of today into this terminology, indirect realism is more common than direct realism, which seems to make sense for me. And after all, direct realism has sometimes been known as naive realism, somewhat critically, although you will you can find direct realists out there today. For example, um, esteemed Michael Lacewing, Dr. Michael Lacewing, author of AQA, an AQA philosophy textbook and a uh, far smarter man than me. Um, I once pinned him down as a direct realist in, in after a seminar that a teaching seminar that he ran. So there you go. They do they do exist. And I have students. I've have had students um, very uh, persuasively, although they didn't convince me, argue in favour of direct realism in essays in the past. But if you're being cynical, I'd say go for indirect realism. So that's my suggestion. Defending indirect realism, explain the issues with it. And the key issue really is. How do you know that there's an objective world independent of, of sense data at all, uh, isn't it? See that epistemology video. And then some counter arguments to those and then deal with those counter arguments. And the very best essays will analyze these counter arguments further with counter counter arguments and responses to those. And you get those from discussion in class and from reading. This is just a summary last minute help revision YouTube video. I can't go into huge detail about all of that. But my guess is you're probably going to end up saying something like, 
what Russell does in the problems of philosophy if you do that, aren't you? You're probably going to be effectively saying, yes, we can't prove 100% deductively, for example, that the, the external world is there, but it's our best hypothesis. It's the best guess. So we, the indirect realist must ultimately perform, ultimately perform some kind of trust that external reality is actually there and objects are there being perceived indirectly, leading to all the different variations in our experience that are, that are possible. Um, my second suggestion for how you would do this, rather than the very rough outline I, I just went through, is also to defend indirect realism, but primarily by talking about direct realism and showing how that is flawed. And so indirect realism must, must, um, must be the correct theory. So walking through direct realism and how the responses to the issues with it fail, therefore indirect realism correct. You could also attack it from that angle or do a blend of, of the two, um, I reckon. All right, so then we come on to the intuition and deduction thesis. And once again, I say, go and look at my other last minute YouTube revision video for epistemology. However, I will linger a bit longer on this because as I've said, I, my guess is the essay, if it's not JTB, is most likely to be this on the 2022 AQA philosophy exam paper. So let's say a little bit more because students, in my experience, really struggle with the intuition and deduction thesis. It used to be a lot more straightforward, like back when I, back, back what when I was a lad and, and studied A-level philosophy myself, because you actually got to read the meditations properly as part of the course, but no longer, which is, which is harder. Uh, unless you read it in, independently. Um, so, yeah, let's linger on this a little bit with a, a semi-helpful diagram. Right, here comes my semi-helpful diagram. So let's just remind ourselves what the intuition and deduction thesis is. The intuition and deduction thesis, remember, is Descartes' idea or argument that it's possible to form a body of knowledge or to work out what can be known philosophically just using a priori intuition to begin with and then deductions from from that a priori intuitions of course being things that he can be certain of just by thinking about them without re referencing or checking them in sense experience and deduction being a process of, of reasoning based on these a priori truths that seeks to prove what must be the case um, as inferences from them. So let's just let's just do a brief reminder and summary of Descartes' project in the Meditations and how he builds up his intuition and deduction thesis. So here's, here's René and he's sitting in this corner of the PowerPoint and he's thinking and he's starting to do his philosophy. He's, he's cogitating and he's thinking that he knows quite a lot of stuff as he sits down to do his philosophy. He knows that 2 plus 3 equals 5 he knows that, um, oh, brain fart, mind blank. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got COVID. That's my, um, that's my disclaimer. He's, he's thinking that baguettes are tasty. There you go. There's a nice, um, horrendous, uh, French, uh, stereotype, bit of a slur. Um, he's thinking that the sky is blue today and so on. There's various different things in his head. And then he decides to, to work out what he can really know for certain because that's going to be the way to, to do really good philosophy is to work out what knowledge does he have with certainty. He says, OK, what can I doubt of this stuff that I know in my mind? This is slightly imprecise, by the way, stuff. Don't write stuff in your exam. AQA um, exam would want precision. That's their favorite word. So make sure you're precise. But what what items of knowledge that are in my mind can I doubt? So this is actually um, skepticism, isn't it? despite having said that we won't, we won't cover this. And he has three waves of doubt, doesn't he? Because first of all, he thinks, well, sometimes my senses can deceive me because sometimes things look like they're really small when they're far away, but you go up to them and they turn out, oh, that was actually quite quite big, um, that tower or that, um, that um, sausage restaurant or whatever. So, <laughs> so um, that means I can doubt my senses, okay? My senses might be deceiving me about things. Then he thinks, oh, and also sometimes, in addition to this, I'm dreaming. So not only can I doubt the actual contents of 
the the external world like the particular happenings that i'm that i'm experiencing that maybe i'm actually experiencing something else actually sometimes it turns out that everything that i was experiencing i.e in a dream was i later uh, decided was false because i was just dreaming and none of it was real so maybe actually there isn't an external world that's real at all maybe i'm just in a dream all the time but even if i was in a dream he's he he says in the meditations paraphrasing very colloquially um he still has some stuff left over that hasn't been wiped out by this because even if he's dreaming you know even in dreams triangles have three sides and bachelors are unmarried men i don't know if descartes was dreaming about unmarried men probably not he's probably dreaming about other things that he's more interested in but at least those other things he's more interested in follow laws of maths all right still follow a priori truths but as you know the famous argument and thought experiment goes what if an evil demon is deceiving me what if uh, there is this all-powerful genius who is able to trick me about things like one plus one equals two and triangles having three sides and so on and even those aren't true it's possible descartes thinks hypothetically to doubt even those ideas so what does he know now uh oh not a lot sad descartes descartes unhappy because descartes have wiped out has wiped out everything he knows by thinking what he can doubt and this is why philosophers tend to be quite miserable because they just overthink things until they don't actually know anything at all anymore you could say that is basically what philosophy is there's a there's a cheerful thought hopefully you're not all too depressed after studying your a-level philosophy you may be but for other reasons we'll see hopefully you won't be depressed in august on results day right stop wittering on um youtuber let's um yeah where does, no, no no that's right actually hang on a minute wait there is hope there is hope of course because you remember he doesn't know nothing at all there is one little ray of sunshine one thing which he thinks he can still know for certain what is it i ask you and i hear you say back to the computer screen it's the cogito he realizes actually even as long as he's thinking and doubting even though he can doubt everything in his mind from the pure fact that he is doubting at all then there must at least be a mind that is doing th this thinking and doubting so the one thing he can be sure of at the beginning of his project the foundation of his intuition and deduction thesis the a priori intuition at the bottom of it as i were is that he is he exists or if you want to put it in terms of the discourse on the method i think therefore i am so even if nothing else he knows is true at least descartes knows he's thinking so at least he must actually exist and he invites you to cheer yourself up a bit by thinking that hey even if you don't know whether anything is true or not at least you exist it's not so bad existing is it so now you have a reason to something to hold on to and to work up from so that is the initial a priori intuition um in the intuition and deduction thesis so where does he go from there because he needs to rebuild the rest of his knowledge doesn't he well descartes looks around in his mind and he sees all oh, as well as existing he also has a clear and distinct idea of god in his mind that got there somehow um if 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 he if he looks around at the internal contents why is he focusing on this in particular well it's going to be very useful to him um in shortly in his in his thesis isn't it because he now from here works up further he's not saying that that god is there yet technically I'm not arguing that that God is real just that he's got an idea of God in his in his head oh and it's a clear and distinct idea as well which means it's in some way like the intuition that he is thinking and doubting it's vivid and clear it's different from his other kinds of ideas and it's a very strong uh sort of mental impression shouldn't have used the word impression that's more a better humane word for a sense experience but it's a very strong mental I experience when he um internally uh looks upon his idea of god so he he goes from there doesn't he and he says well by the principle of sufficient reason which he probably got from leibniz which is that every effect must have a cause which is as great or greater than it which is as perfect or more perfect than it he is not powerful enough to have caused this idea and i'm glossing here i'm summarizing you you really ideally need to have more knowledge of this from your notes and, and and your lessons but this is a revision video so i'm gonna i'm gonna gloss it um because his idea of god is of is of a perfect being and he himself is not a perfect being there must be a more powerful cause of this idea than himself he can't have produced it himself therefore 
So this is a trade up mark argument, isn't it? There must actually be a God who caused it. And that is interwoven with his cosmological argument, isn't it? That there must also be, be a, a powerful being that is keeping Descartes in existence at every moment that he exists because he's not powerful enough to do that. But basically, in this rough tier of the intuition and deduction thesis, building up pictorially, he's, he's establishing that there is a God. And he later does it with the ontological argument, doesn't he, as well, and, and throws, throws that in um, to which you know from Metaphysics of God. But so what does he know now? Now he knows that he is, he exists, and he thinks he's also shown that there is a God who exists too. So where does he go now? Because there's still plenty of other stuff to know that he doesn't know for, for sure yet, like all of his sense experience, whether that's true, whether there is actually external world out there. So next he reflects on that. So he also has some sense experience that seems to be out of external of an external world. And summarizing greatly again, so this is a condensed gloss, go back to the textbooks, go back to uh, Dr. Lacewing's far more thorough and... Um, rigorous material go back to your lesson notes but effectively by the principle of sufficient reason again that every effect must have a cause that is as great or greater than it he is not powerful enough to cause this experience and also he doesn't choose to experience these things um, he's not willing to have an experience of the external world it just appears to happen to him so either there is an external world that is causing these experiences to happen to him or he is being tricked e.g by that evil demon uh, that he hypothesized about earlier. But hang on, is he really being tricked? Well, if those are the two alternatives, he thinks he can knock out the second one because he knows God exists. And remember, this God that he established with a principle of sufficient reason back here is a perfect God. Um, it was an idea of a perfect being that was in his mind, a clear and distinct idea of a perfect being, no less. And this, such a perfect God would not allow him to be deceived about whether an external world is there or not. So summarizing greatly, paraphrasing a lot of Latin, uh, therefore he must be perceiving an external world actually, and his senses must be accurate at least most of the time when he's not dreaming or tripping or what have you. Um, so yeah, there is an external world and he's not being deceived because God is not a deceiver and would not let him be deceived. So there you have it. QED, Bob's your uncle, go home now. Thankfully, Descartes has proved to us that uh, not only is he and does he exist, but there is a God, and this God guarantees that there is also an external world. Has he? Well, I think not, and most people tend to think not. So if you do get the essay on this, well, what you, will you be saying? On to the next slide. If you do get the essay on this, very few contemporary philosophers, if any, maybe there's some rogue Cartesians out there who still love the intuition and deduction thesis, but I haven't met any or read of any. Um, very few contemporary philosophers, if any, think that Descartes is successful in this intuition and deduction thesis, this argument that you can establish everything that is worth knowing and sure knowledge of oneself and the external world just by a priori thought and inference alone. And the common criticism is that he heads into Cartesian circles, that he falls foul of Cartesian circles, isn't it? What is that? Well, it's the claim, it's the uh, the criticism that he argues in a circular fashion, but be as precise as you can about exactly what that is. You could say is that he uses clear and distinct ideas to prove God's existence and then uses God to prove clear and distinct ideas. I think if you want to be as precise as possible on my reading of Descartes and that which I was encouraged in by my philosophy teacher at school. Thank you, Mr. Unwin. Shout out to Mr. Unwin. Um, absolutely fantastic philosophy teacher. Couldn't have asked for a better one um, at, at sixth form. Um, it, the idea that he uses, if you were paying very close attention on the previous slide, is the principle of sufficient reason. Because if, if you're really listening and watching carefully, that just appeared without any deduction to justify it of its own. So I think it's actually the principle of sufficient re uh, reason on my reading, which is the clear and distinct idea that Descartes assumes the truth of in order to prove the existence of God, which then 
does further things in 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 his project that is the bit which he just um yeah which he which he assumes when he he could actually doubt that so you might actually agree with him that you can't doubt that you are you exist or that you are thinking therefore you are fair enough i mean some people will get, take issue with even that won't they like hume or a buddhist and and so on and say that no you're just a bundle of impressions there is no i or nietzsche would as well wouldn't he um, there is no i that these can be collected under there is just thoughts the thinking and impressions happening but if, even if you're prepared to sign up to that it's perfectly possible and usually i think perfectly common for someone to be able to doubt the truth of the principle of sufficient reason and in saying that and the saying that there must be a cause greater than or equal to the perfection or the 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 power or greatness of every effect that it appears there's ways of arguing back with that and you can doubt it therefore he's using the assumption of its truth as a as it's 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 question begging he's um he's assuming something and he does then yeah later use god to guarantee the truth of of things like the like the principle of sufficient reason so that seems circular if i'd record this on a day when i was feeling better that explanation would have been clearer but that's what you've got today and hey you're getting this for free so stop stop complaining right suggestion it would be an unusual essay then given all that i've just waffled that uh defended descartes and said yes the intuition and deduction thesis is brilliant let's all go and be 16th 17th century rationalists and just sit in our armchairs and create amazing philosophical projects that tell us everything we need to know by deduction alone i mean you can do that if you want to if you want to go right ahead just knock yourself out buy a massive armchair um but i'm expecting you're probably not going to do that so if you do attack descartes in the sense of take him on philosophically not travel back in time and try to kill him for writing the philosophy he did which means you had to study his thoughts for your for your a level yes use cartesian circles and so on all those stock criticisms because it's very hard to be original in an a-level philosophy essay uh, it's hard to be original in philosophy full stop i think but let alone an a-level essay but that said my italics here the very best essays will analyze the counter arguments to descartes in depth and consider possible responses to them which you find in reading and in discussion so don't just say here's descartes here's a textbook criticism bam move on try and push it further if you want the a if you want the a star to well descartes could say back this but i would retort this and so on because that is the actual process of doing philosophy the dialogical or perhaps triological um procedure of of analytic philosophical conversation and thought yeah we want we want hegelian progressions through thesis and antithesis and synthesis oh apparently i'm done with epistemology now and we're on to ethics although this video is already 38 minutes long which is far too long and is about the length of a lesson in a private school state schools they go a bit longer to 60 minutes because it takes longer to do things um no i'm sorry that no, no that's i'm going to stand by that that is just true so i'm going to carry on with ethics in another video also because i've started saying very very strange things and i'm about to run out of steam so um stay tuned tune in again next time for some ethics bye okie dokie let's revise some ethics uh carrying on from my where my last video left off the epistemology 2022 uh edition revision video so here is what the past paper question the recent past paper question table looks like for ethics for aqa philosophy for 2022 so what's on the advanced information for 2022 well where's laser pointer gone here it is uh you have got on the advanced information haven't you they've tipped us off because of the corona apocalypse that there's going to be utilitarianism coming up kantianism is going to be coming up virtue ethics will make an appearance uh there'll be no applied ethics and they've left out moral realism but oh look this is a bit weird and sort of shows how the whole idea of doing advanced information is a bit pointless depending on the exam board they've put on moral anti-realism so if you get an essay on moral anti-realism which is quite possible given that all of the normative theories have come up in the last three years 
and utilitarianisms on the specimen paper. Um, how are you going to talk about moral anti-realism without talking about moral realism? Well, you can. It's probably not going to be a very good essay, but you, you can you can absolutely try and just yeah I guess you could stick to just the criticisms of moral anti-realism, but you're going to be it would be helpful to know all the all the stuff about moral realism as well and cognitivism. Um, uh, yeah, so mm, that's tricky. That's tricky. This sort of basically shows how you need to know all of the specification and have been taught it anyway although that said yes except applied so that's probably not going to come up so anyway long story short um you're going to get asked questions about normative theories and then actually yes technically the 25 marker could be on any of the normative theories because they're in the advanced information however i just wonder if it will be about moral anti-realism and it will be a meta ethics 25 marker because the normative theories have all come up in previous years maybe they'll do something really shocking and do a repeat but if it was a normal year, then I would be gambling on on meta ethics. The fact that they haven't put moral realism on the advanced information is the is the weird um, curveball in the mix there to mix metaphors and also repeat the word mix um, for the third time now. So, yeah, this is a tricky one to question. Guess I would probably have essays up my sleeve, both for meta ethics and for the normative theory. So I'm going to be talking about those briefly in this rambling revision video so let's talk about utilitarianism first of all now i don't have another revision video on youtube for ethics to refer you to because i haven't made one before and i haven't actually taught ethics for aqa philosophy for a few years although i've taught ethics for uh, aqa religious studies and ocr but i have taught it before so this is going to be revision for me but let's just blitz through some ideas um to do with ethics and remind you of these things for this free um last minute youtube revideo revideo wow um disclaimer i currently have covid so even weirder things than usual are coming out of my mouth at the moment revision video there's a nice neologism there revideo i might i might use that in the future no i won't so if you're in a classroom setting right now, or perhaps even if you're watching this by yourself, um, shivering in the dark the night before the philosophy paper one exam, desperately trying to cram some more knowledge into your head, I suggest for the sake of your brain and retention, i.e. your learning, uh, pause this video just now and see if you can whistle through these bullet points and say what they all refer to in a sentence or two, which is what I will be doing in just a moment. I'm going to be doing that now. So what the question of what is meant by utility and maximizing utility in utilitarianism. Utility, as you know, in philosophy, in the world of moral philosophy, doesn't mean just usefulness. It's usefulness for um, for maximizing happiness or for facilitating happiness. Uh, right. So, yeah, utility is that which is useful for happiness. That is what utilitarians seek to maximize according to their moral theory so bentham mill say the best thing to aim for to do if you're trying to work out what the right thing to do is the right thing is to maximize utility to try and bring about the most amount of happiness especially if it's bentham talking most most amount of happiness pleasure for the most amount of people that's what maximizing utility is hopefully you know this because this is the you know the the easier more introductory end of ethics so bentham is the first person who formulated this philosophically and came up with quantitative hedonistic utilitarianism what's that well you remember in other words utilitarianism that thinks things are amounts of uh, pleasure is measurable in some way at least in conceptual terms it can be um, thought of in terms of quantity and amount Hedonistic underlines the fact that really for Bentham it is more about pleasure than happiness and all pleasures are equal effectively for Bentham. So it's, it's the maximizing of happiness in terms of pleasure. And he has a calculus for that, doesn't he? Not a calculator. Low prior attaining students sometimes think he had an actual calculator, I don't know, with, with happiness buttons on that he got to press. No, it's a calculus. It's a method for working out the conceptual quantities of of pleasure when you're weighing up what action is going to result in what and therefore what to do so he considers the intensity duration certainty remoteness fecundity purity and extent of pleasure that will result from different uh, available options doesn't he 
um, when you're when you're cons considering a particular act and, and what to do. Useful to have those up your sleeve. Do you need them memorized? Well, I think it's useful. I, I, I memorize them every year in revision time uh, with students and then probably forget them until next year. But you can load them up into your short term memory because there might just be an occasion where it's useful to to trot those out. Um, if it's an essay, I wouldn't go waste time by explaining what every single one means, but one or two might serve as, as useful uh, for examples. So that's Bentham's utilitarianism. Then Mill comes along, doesn't he? Who also has hedonistic utilitarianism that's about um, pleasure, although I, I would say for Mill, um, Mill speaks more in terms of happiness than, than pleasure. That seems to be his, his preferred word. Also, it's slightly different from Bentham, isn't it? Because it's qualitative, his approach. What does that mean? Well, not all pleasures are created equal for Mill, are they? They are for Bentham. Bentham's perfectly happy for people to get completely wasted on gin and play pushpin to play pub games and, um, you know, um, uh, or gamble on slot machines and, and so on. If that's how you want to get your kicks, go for it. Also for, for Bentham, animal pleasure is as good as human pleasure. Let's let's uh, make everyone as happy as possible. And our, our pleasure is, is qualitatively no different from that of pigs, perhaps. Mill disagrees. Mill says, no, um, better Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Our human kind of pleasure is of a greater quality than... Um, than animal pleasures. This is what we're interested in. And also within human pleasures, there's different kinds of pleasures, aren't there? There are higher and lower pleasures. Higher pleasures, such as listening to um, Dr. Tarasenko's YouTube revision video about philosophy, which will bring you to the very heights of ecstasy and, and joyous experience as your intellect um, contemplates these wondrous and marvellous ideas. And lower pleasures, like I don't know, playing Mario Kart or something. That's what I'll be doing later. Better examples might be, you know, uh, I mean, stereotypical examples, things like reading Shakespeare or um, eating a, a Big Mac. Well, Mill wouldn't have spoken about Big Macs, but you, I hopefully understand what we're getting at here now or your memories being, being jogged. So there's different kinds of pleasure. Not all pleasures are created equal for Mill. So you're wanting to maximise the higher kind of pleasures. What's his proof of the greatest happiness principle? Well, you remember... Um, Mill effectively says, well, he, he's actually sort of saying you can't prove that we should all be utilitarians, but actually, in effect, we are all utilitarians because it's just what everyone does. Everyone does try to maximise their happiness. And if they think about it enough, the happiness of others in life, we all pursue pleasure. We're all going after pleasure and happiness anyway. So it must be that that is what we should do. So his proof of the principle that we should be aiming to maximise happiness is that this is what we do anyway. Bentham, I think, would say would say a similar thing, but Mill just um, the, there's the extract in the the Cardinal Hayward Jones textbook, isn't there? He takes the the trouble to underline and spell out spell out this idea anymore. The proof is in the pudding. The proof is that. Everyone actually is always aiming for happiness all the time. So this this just must be how life works and what we should be doing. Huge is ought problem there, which will come you'll come back to in, in meta ethics. But yeah, that's that's effectively what Mill says on my understanding. Then you've got other forms of non hedonistic utilitarianism, like perhaps you know uh, Moore's non naturalist consequentialism or something, or perhaps more straightforwardly preference utilitarianism as of Peter Singer, where it's not that you're maximising happiness, it's not put in those terms, even if it's doing something very similar. Singer speaks as a preference utilitarian in terms of maximising the satisfaction of preferences, doesn't he? So trying to make sure that as many people's preferences for what they want to happen are being fulfilled and satisfied as possible when considering what is ethically right to do and what are good actions. And then for some reason, the specification puts down here act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism where they could have served just as well up here because Bentham, remember, we said he considers uh, using his calculus the relative pleasure outcomes for different individual acts. And that's what you decide to do as you go along making eth ethical decisions. Mill, we could have said and should have added on that when he's aiming for his qualitatively higher pleasures, seeks to formulate rules that will generally lead to the most amount of pleasure for the most amount of people. And then you follow those rather than making it up as you go along effectively or working out for each individual act. 
Mill says, let's formulate some rules that tend to lead to the most amount of pleasure for the most amount of people of a higher quality. So he's a rule utilitarianism, utilitarian. So that's utilitarianism in a nutshell. But there are issues with it, aren't there? Because Robert Nozick, is it Robert? I think so. Nozick might present you with a machine which you could get into and it will make you feel total pleasure all of the time in this wonderful virtual experience where you're feeling happy and pleasure all the pushing all the buttons all the right buttons for you they will make you feel really great all the time but it wouldn't be real and knowing that would you go into the this machine this so-called experience machine well some people would fair enough to you some people would feel very uncomfortable about going in like me and wouldn't go in and Nozick seeks to show by this thought experiment successfully to my mind excuse me, that um, that this means that pleasure can't be the only good, it can't be the only thing we should be aiming for in our life. We also want other things like real states of affairs in the in the world to be brought about through our actions. So maybe utilit utilitarianism's basic first premise that the most important thing to aim for and the good is pleasure is flawed. So um, you could use that and you can uh, consider that especially if you get an essay on utilitarianism then you've got issues around fairness and liberty in rights and the tyranny of the majority why because well if you're maximizing the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number then you're going to do what's best for the majority aren't you even with preference to utilitarianism which you can see as a, a kind of way of doing ethical democracy uh, some people are going to be left out with unsatisfied preferences because uh, you might argue you can't keep everyone happy all of the time but you could argue as a critic of utilitarianism, this is going to mean that sometimes people's freedom, their liberty and their rights are going to be overlooked and abused because you're making the, the, the overall majority number happier, but some people might be losing out in that calculation. Um, you know, for example, this is this is where you could have things like, well, you could push this a bit further into things like the examples of sadism or um, people being executed or uh, happening um, involved in the gladiatorial games and and so on. The overall uh, majority might be happy watching people being executed or fighting in in um, in the arena or um, torturing others, but those people are going to be really unhappy. But utilitarianism doesn't care because it says as long as everyone's uh, as long as you've got the greatest amount of happiness overall yep some people are going to lose out sometimes so what if those people get stomped on in in the process that's effectively the problem then you have problems with calculation can you really measure pleasure can you put a number to the intensity duration um certainty remoteness fecundity purity extent of of pleasure outcomes from different actions well probably not and to be fair bentham probably thought not but he at least thought that pleasure was quantifiable in some way and this criticism is going to say well is it even really quantifiable at all isn't this at most a very vague uh foreknowledge of of um what pleasure is going to emerge and is it really possible to measure different pleasure outcomes against one another and also we can't predict the future with certainty so doesn't that throw a spanner in the works for this this theory with perhaps any large degree of certainty at all so how do we really know that what we expect is going to emerge as a pleasure outcome from an action is really going to emerge from it or not and you also have the problem as we alluded to earlier um, with the difference between Mill and Bentham that how do you decide which beings to include in your in your calculations because you know potentially everyone in the whole world is going to be affected by what you do um, so where do you draw the line in your consideration of, of pleasure effects also do you include beings like animals and and so on um, as, as as we said earlier so there's a big problem there then you've got problems about partiality so uh, which was that one? Oh yes that's the one where it's observed that we are just very partial and we don't seem to have problems with this people tend to prefer and to um, partially preference their family for example when they're making moral decisions and put their own kith and kin first their children their significant others their romantic partners uh, and the pleasure of those people above the pleasure of anyone joe bloggs um tom dick and harry um when they're when they're going about their life so doesn't this show that there's a problem with utilitarianism because it's asking us to be completely impartial and make a mathematical um uh, calculation 
in, in Bentham's case to decide what to do it from a neutral standpoint, which we can't really do. So is this really uh, an effective or a, a satisfying moral theory when it doesn't describe how we make moral decisions in those situations uh, ad adequately? And then we've got, finally, before I run out of breath, whether utilitarianism ignores both the moral integrity and the intentions of the individual or not. What's that about? Well, that's saying, it's effectively saying from a deontological standpoint, utilitarianism is sometimes going to lead to doing actions which we would be really uncomfortable with, or we would be counter it would be counterintuitive for us to say um, we, we want to do. Such as, well, think of uh, Foote and Thompson's famous trolley problem. Uh, would you flip a switch to stop five being, or three or five, I forget, there's different versions, uh, people being killed so that one person is killed? Yes, maybe, maybe you might you might do that, but someone like Kant is going to say, hang on, you are actively bringing about a murder by, by doing that. Even if something would happen if you left it alone, aren't you compromising your moral integrity by flipping the switch so that one person is killed because you are actively responsible for that person's death? in this case. So maybe actually moral integrity, the particular actions we are doing and our intentions are more important than the consequences of actions and so on when it comes to moral theories. So there's a very quick whistle stop tour of some utilitarian ideas. Hopefully that's jogged your memory to some extent. So what do you do if a utilitarianism question comes up for the 25 marker? Well, Remember, I would think in this year that this is being recorded, 2022, I think it's highly unlikely that the 25 marker will be on utilitarianism because it's come up on the sample paper and it's come up recently before. Um, so I don't really think it's worth planning one. Uh, but because it's relevant if in case virtue ethics or Kantian ethics come up, and I think Kantian ethics is extremely unlikely to come up. Maybe may worth knowing that the data shows that contemporary philosophers are pretty evenly split on which normative ethical theory they prefer. It's about a third are utilitarians, a third are Kantians, about a third are virtue ethicists, although virtue ethics is quite trendy these days. Virtue ethics comes out very slightly ahead, at least in the Phil Papers uh, survey. Maybe this is because they're basically all doing um, well, they're not doing the same thing, but you know, they're, they're all different routes up the same mountain as uh, Derek Parfit might might argue. So they're, they're all theorizing about the same sets of behaviors and and values, but approaching them slightly differently. So maybe it depends, you know, what particular flavor uh, of, of ethics you like is, is basically just up to personal preference. Um, so I, I can't really cynically offer you uh, a moral theory to, to prefer based on the numbers, although perhaps you might be slightly towards uh, inclined towards virtue ethics. So you almost certainly won't get an essay on utilitarianism, but if it, you got an essay on Kant, or you almost certainly won't get one on Kant, or virtue ethics, you could bring it in. So don't worry about this slide too much. That is to say, you could bring it in, by the way. Uh, you can always use alternative normative theories to criticize other ones and show that they're better, but you absolutely would not have to. Uh, no, no compulsion here. Let's keep going. Right, let's get on to virtue ethics itself then. So a completely different way of doing ethics, of course, where utilitarianism is consequentialist and teleological, so interested in consequences and outcomes of actions out there in the world. Virtue ethics is agent-centered, isn't it? As Julia Annas called it in a, an influential journal article. So it's concerned with developments of characteristics in the moral agent or actor, the person who's doing the, the deeds and trying to live ethically and virtu virtuously uh, is, is what virtue ethics concerns itself with rather than consequences of their actions in the world, or even the actions themselves, uh, really, as Kant is more interested in. So what's the good, according to virtue ethics, the good for human beings? Well, it's not pleasure, be clear on this. The good, that which we are seeking to aim for and bring about by living ethically, is eudaimonia, remember, for Aristotle. 
that's our final end, our telos or, or goal that we should be trying to work towards through living ethically. And remember, eudaimonia, so literally good spiritedness, I think flourishing, a state of flourishing is probably the best English translation personally or sometimes gets called other things happiness is a bit vague and loose and doesn't underline enough i think the the relationship between eudaimonia and pleasure slash happiness which is that yes if you are eudaimon if you are exhibiting eudaimonia aristotle thinks you're going to be experiencing pleasure because it's it's good it's good to be eudaimon and it does it does come along with happiness it goes hand in hand with happiness however they are not the same thing here it's actually more that a, a pleasurable existence in a, and a happy life is a consequence of being eudaimon and, and flourishing but they are not the same so we're not aiming for happiness slash pleasure as in utilitarianism in the world of virtue ethics we're aiming for a state of flourishing why well second second bullet point he gets to this through his function argument doesn't he so coming from a teleological view of the world where everything in the world fulfills a function aristotle argues that humans must have a function too how do you know what a human's function is well you look at what's unique to humans don't you and what's what's unique to us that we have that inanimate objects and other parts of the universe and plants and animals and so on and so on don't well we have a rational aspect of our soul don't we we have the ability to reason and think rationally therefore our function must involve act, thinking and acting rationally exercising our reason and this is where there's a bit of a jump this may be a bit tricky to uh, get your head around as a 21st century person it certainly is for me not someone living thousands of years ago in ancient greece um, if we are living rationally we will be exercising virtues in accordance with reason why well all a virtue is is a characteristic of something that is performing its function well or excellently so it's a virtue of a good can opener that it is good at opening cans it's sharp easy to hold so on etc classic example but for a human that you um, to be fulfilling your function well is you're living in accordance with reason reason and you will be displaying certain virtues that go hand in hand with that uh, that state and that um, mode of living so therefore our function our aim is to think and act rationally in accordance with virtue and this will bring about eudaimonia so all these different ideas are interrelated in aristotle in quite a complicated way but that's that's the simplest way i can put it at least from my understanding of aristotle so then in the rest of the nicomachean ethics bullet point three he goes to quite some lengths to expound the specifics of what these virtues that we will cultivate and display if we are um exercising our, our reason and how we live are doesn't he and the corresponding vices that they contrast with so bullet point three remember virtues are character traits or dispositions that we develop so they're not actions they're not consequences they're character traits that we have like courage or temperance or magnanim magnanimity what however you say it um those those kinds of character traits so because they're traits you can't just switch them on you don't just decide wake up one day and decide to be virtuous oh and look i've become virtuous i now have the virtues you have to be educated and habituated into developing them so you have to be taught how to do them by following moral exemplars maybe reading some aristotle listening to your your philosophy teacher and you have to practice them you have to develop the habit of acting virtuously in order to cultivate and develop these character traits in yourself so that you get better and better at doing it so they're like skills they're not just one-time decisions it's not an actions table that you read off um, you have to develop the skill of living virtuously in order to cultivate the virtues and always come back to those character traits because remember that's what aristotle is fundamentally interested in because the actions that bring these about can change 
as we'll say in a minute but the the virtues that he wants us to aim for do not change for Aristotle although of course modern ethic uh, virtue ethicists have uh, adapted his list of virtues and decided on their own uh, preferred virtues so again because you don't just once decide to do this and then you can rationally do it as Kant might say might uh, you, you need to get your feelings on board as you are developing these virtues because we don't just have a rational thinking part of our soul we also have the emotional and feeling part of our soul which can sometimes depending on how virtuously we have been living be in conflict with uh, our reason and what we if we think about it see uh, we should be doing and and the ways that we if we think about it see that we should be living so as we practice and form the habit and receive education in the development of moral character our feelings will come on board with our rational desire to live virtuously and they'll start to line up more and more with uh, virtuous character traits and the doctrine of the mean is last on this bullet point but we could have mentioned it earlier remember these virtues Aristotle's list of virtues they always lie in between two different vices a vice of excess when you have too much of, the, of a certain character trait and a vice a kakia of deficiency when you don't have enough of the character trait so the classic example which I'm going to give but if you have another one and you're asked about this um, I would use it because the examiners were going to read about courage so much but the classic example is courage too much of the character trait of courage then you're rash that's rashness not enough of the character trait and then you're cowardly so that's cowardice so you want to hit the mean character trait that lies in the middle between those two extremes but remember you will not uh, achieve that and cultivate that through doing the same action in every situation sometimes the mean virtue which is what Aristotle is interested in will look like attacking if, if, if it's courage or, or be, being assertive sometimes it will look like backing off sometimes it might look like doing nothing at all but you can't straightforwardly map actions onto virtues like that so it's not the mean action it's the mean character trait the virtue that's uh, in between two extremes and then you work out what actions are going to bring about and cultivate that character trait in you which make which is why virtue ethics gets called flexible and if you are asked to evaluate virtue ethics then that can either be a strength or a weakness of virtue ethics depending on what you want from a moral theory which I suggest you say up front if you get an essay on it because then you can evaluate it against that yardstick so if one man's flexible or one per humans one person's flexible to be gender inclusive is uh, another person's vague or wishy-washy don't say wishy-washy in the exam but then we come on to moral responsibility in Aristotle this is really tricky so three different terms for how Aristotle understands whether you volunteered to do an action or not whether you chose to do it or not there's a really good diagram about this in the Cardinal Hayward Jones textbook which I refer to you go and make your own version of that diagram if you haven't got one already and, and memorize it in case you're asked about this but basically to run through it really quickly Aristotle um, if if you're trying to work out whether you are responsible for an action he says think about it in this way first ask did you intend to do it so that's the most straightforward one if yes then it was voluntary and you are responsible for the action so that's pretty straightforward isn't it if no then there's another question were you ignorant of what you were doing or not were you aware of were you um, aware of what you were actually doing and and the consequences if you were ignorant of what was going on then it's a non-voluntary action this third one in this case you are responsible because you still did something but there's the possibility of forgiveness if you regret what you did without knowing it e.g King Oedipus choosing to kill his father and marry his mother didn't know what was going on so if he's sorry and he def he's definitely sorry then uh, can be forgiven but that's the non-voluntary because you weren't in full awareness of of the circumstances and and the option that you were you were choosing if you were not ignorant of what were, was going on you were fully aware of what choice you were making in doing something naughty or in Aristotle's language cultivating a um, a negative disposition or failing to cultivate a virtuous disposition there's one more question were you forced to do what you were aware 
you were doing. If you were forced, then it's an involuntary action that you were um, of a second class that you were compelled to do. So it's an involuntary compelled action, e.g. Um, I knew I was uh, killing my father and marrying my mother, but I was literally forced to do it. It's kind of hard to imagine how that situation could ever come about. But insert your own example. It's a bit of an unfortunate example. So in this case, you are not responsible. If, however, you were not ignorant of what you were doing and you were not forced, uh, which probably means that uh, there was some external influence on your action, which isn't so strong as to be called a compulsion, e.g. you weren't literally grabbed by the arm and made to take the cookie from the, the cookie jar with, with no actual um, willful participation of your own. But if it's more like someone was holding a gun to your head saying, take the cookie from the cookie jar. And so you still actually chose to, did it, to do it, but it was under a more external kind of influence. Um, then that is an involuntary mixed action. And again, for Aristotle, you are responsible for this with the possibility of forgiveness if you regret the action, like a like a standard non-voluntary action. So that's pretty darn complicated, but that's the best I can explain it. I suggest making a diagram or flowchart to go through all those different options and then getting them into your head. Let's keep going. The relationship between virtues, actions and reasons and the role of practical reasoning slash wisdom, phrenesis in Aristotle. So basically, this is a bit like another flowchart, um, really. Remember that for Aristotle, you have reasons to do things because you are a rational soul and you've thought about it and you see that what you should be aiming for is to become eudaimon and cultivate virtue, which are your motivations for doing actions which bring about the virtues in yourself. And the process of applying your reason to work out what actions will bring about what virtues and I suppose what virtues you should be aiming for in the first place, um, that is a that involves a process of practical wisdom, which again, you have to uh, do it, work at developing and be educated and habituated into because it's a skill, phrenesis, that you have to develop. I suppose, properly speaking, it, it most is concerned with the application of reason in order to work out what actions will bring about what virtues. But that's that's the way the the flow chart kind of goes reasons motivate actions which lead to developing virtues and your feelings will uh, align more and more with these virtuous actions as, as you work at this so there's virtue ethics in a nutshell this is going to be a very long video but that's fine there's lots of content uh, for a level philosophy even in a even in an advanced information year um, and hopefully you've had enough time to watch this whole video if you're finding it useful or skip to the relevant bits. What are issues with virtue ethics? Well, here's some. We've already mentioned this one a bit earlier. Does it really give sufficiently clear guidance about how to act? Well, arguably no, because you're not really being told do this, do that, like Kant would, or given uh, a clear external um, idea to, to aim for. So it's up to you to work out how you're going to cultivate the virtues that Aristotle suggests you should be seeking or, or perhaps in, in modern forms of virtue ethics that you want to be cultivating. Although, again, if you think that's the best a moral theory can do and it shouldn't be trying to give rigid rules about how how to live, but giving a, a more of a framework or, or indeed a rougher uh, set of guidelines, then maybe you do think that is sufficient. So that's, I, I think, really is up to you in your own moral intuitions, although you might have more uh, pedantic and uh, logical ways of picking holes in the alternative moral theories, if you like virtue ethics. Then you've got the problem of clashing and competing virtues. So what about when it looks, it's not clear which um, virtue to prioritise in a, in a certain scenario or, or circumstance and there's the possibility of cultivating multiple different virtues but it doesn't look like it's going to be possible to cultivate them um, in tandem with one another so they're going to be competing example well let's take say euthanasia and let's take perhaps the more modern um, virtues of compassion 
or justice, although I believe justice is actually one of our Aristotle's virtues, do you aim to prioritise and cultivate the virtue of compassion by allowing the person who is very unwell to pass away and facilitating that by um, uh, carrying out euthanasia? Or do you uh, aim to cultivate the virtue of justice or perhaps tough love by refusing to allow them to uh, to pass um, because it's against the law, because it's taking a life and, and so on. So maybe a slightly artificial example, you might have better ones, but what do you do when the virtues are competing against one another? Then we've got the possibility of circularity involved in defining virtuous acts and virtuous persons in terms of each other, because how does Aristotle get his list of what virtues to aim for? Well, he thinks you can just work them out by thinking about it, but whether that's true or not is definitely up for debate, isn't it? Because he probably gets them from the supposedly virtuous uh, people of the ancient Greek intellectual elite, people like him, unsurprisingly. Uh, Middle-aged white men who think very hard about things and are esteemed by certain sectors of society for, for doing so, much like many philosophers today. So is... Yeah, isn't that, isn't that circular? Because you you ask him, how do we know what the virtues are? And he says, well, look at these virtuous people. It's the character traits that they have. Well, how do we know that they are virtuous? Because they act virtuously and they have the virtuous character traits. We're, we're in a circle here. What, how do we step outside the circle and externally verify what actually are the virtuous positive characteristics to be aiming for? And then, oh, this I might have sandwiched two bullet points here together, or they might be together on, on the spec. Whether a trait must contribute to eudaimonia in order to be a virtue. This is the idea that you could theoretically have someone who was living in, extreme, in an extremely virtuous way, say a nurse working at the front line in Ukraine, uh, slogging their guts out to take care of other people and um, being extremely generous with their their time and courageous and honest and so on and so forth but they're actually really miserable because they're working so hard and the conditions are so terrible they're under so much stress stress excuse me and pressure so that they are really not flourishing uh, doesn't that suggest that there is a disconnect here potentially between living virtuously what if what if doing these actions and aiming to cultivate these virtues doesn't actually lead to flourishing and being eudaimon there's a possible criticism and then the relationship between the good for the individual and moral good some some philosophers are just going to turn around aren't they and say well it's all very well saying that we should be aiming to cultivate certain traits in ourselves and that's what ethics is all about but isn't that far too individualistic isn't that just focusing on oneself? Really, morality should be about what you are putting into the world, what you're contributing to the world as part of the, the human community and how you are influencing and affecting it. Not um, just perhaps or not even at all, perhaps what sort of personality or uh, what sort of traits you are developing in your own in your own being. So, um, yeah, just because something is good for an individual doesn't mean it necessarily is contributing to a wider communitarian moral good. So lots of ways to attack virtue ethics and pick holes in it potentially as well. So what do you do if you get the virtue ethics essay? It could come up. I think it's unlikely to appear, but perhaps is more likely to appear than uh, utilitarianism and certainly Kant, given that utilitarianism's come up twice since the new spec's been around and Kant was last year in the retake paper. So go with what you really think, as ever, if you do have a, an opinion and your lessons have actually developed an opinion in you. Remember that virtue ethics comes out very slightly ahead in the um, artificial data, which I shouldn't be encouraging you to think about, really. So if you're being cynical, you might want to defend it. Um, yeah, and what I've put in this bullet point is basically the same as, as on the other slide. Uh, remember, note how you, how you evaluate a normative ethical theory has a lot to do with what you want from a normative ethical theory at all, because there's no rules about what they should offer, um, I would argue. So they tend to be evaluated against people's own moral intuitions and desires for a moral theory. Once, once you've worked out whether it's a logical and coherent system or not, how much it is capable of, ach of achieving is going to satisfy you depending on what you want out of, of morality and what you want 
to be um, told um, or, or helped in, in doing, I think. So I think that can be a helpful thing to remember when you're having a go at the slippery discipline of analysing and evaluating ethical theories in essays in case this comes up. Onwards. So let's continue with Kant. Immanuel Kant's account of what is meant by a good will. So again, we're in a completely different or a very different world of ethics if we're thinking about Kant, who comes next on the specification. We're in the deontological world of ethics, the world of what actions are necessary, what must be done, what reason commands that we do. And Kant's account of or Kant's ethical system as outlined in the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals starts with the idea of a good will. Remember, so this is what ethics should start with, which is the will to do one's moral duty purely because it is your moral duty, which reason shows uh, that uh, it shows you that you should do and compels you to do. That is a good will uh, for Kant. A, 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 um, yeah, a, a, a rational willing and choosing to do good actions simply because they are good actions. So this brings us straight away to the second bullet point as well, the distinction between acting in accordance with duty and out of duty, which you can tell me is um, the difference between doing the right thing or just happening to do the right thing for some reason, some incidental reason, and doing the right thing because it is the right thing that's acting out of duty and obviously from what we've just said Kant prefers the latter doesn't he so let's say let's say um let's say attending a philosophy lesson attending a philosophy lesson um completely random example which I suppose Kant's probably not going to say is is your moral duty it's, it's to do with your hypothetical Im imperatives but let's say he did think that it was your your rational duty to attend philosophy lessons if you were attending a philosophy lesson purely because you want to get a good grade or because your parents are forcing you go to go to school um, or because you're going to get in trouble if you don't then you're just acting in accordance with duty but if you attend your philosophy lesson purely because it is the right good and correct thing to do as reason shows you and for that and that is why you, you are actually attending and coming to the lesson that is acting out of duty so that's the distinction then we've got hypothetical and categorical imperatives so remember an imperative is a command something which you should do hypothetical imperatives are the regular kind of Im imperatives are things which you should do which it is in a sense commanded that you do if you want to achieve certain hypothetical goals so actually here's where the philosophy lesson example is more appropriate because if you have that let's say hypothetically you have the goal of getting a good grade in your a-level philosophy in that case it is imperative that you go to your lessons and that you revise and that you do well in the exam uh, and that you work you know you give the exam your best shot and so on those are imperatives that you would follow to achieve that hypothetical goal. But actually, technically, in contradiction to what I said from the previous bullet point, which was just um, an example, uh, it is not morally required of you that you must get an A grade in philosophy in order to live a moral life, because that is the world of a categorical imperative. So a categorical imperative is um, something which reason commands you do, which you must do, which you should do, categorically in all situations and which you would will that everyone do in any similar situation so these are actual the the um the categorical imperative is a moral requirement that applies at all times to everyone hypothetical imperatives are requirements that you need to fulfill in order to achieve certain goals which you don't have to adopt you just might adopt them or not but there's no ethical requirement that you do so Kant thinks it is actually possible to work out what you categorically should, well, technically shouldn't do using your reason alone, because he's a big fan of reason, like all philosophers. But he, he thinks reason, rather than showing you virtues to cultivate or that we should be aiming for happiness and maximising happiness and, and pleasure, he thinks reason can actually give you uh, a list of commands, effectively, of things things um, that you should be not, not be doing. How? 
Well, here's the first way to formulate the categorical imperative, because I believe technically there's there's only one, if we're being really pernickety with, with our language. What does he say? He says, act in such a way that, uh, no, sorry, act according to that maxim, which you would at the same time uh, will to become a universal law without contradiction, which is very wordy and difficult, isn't it? But what's he saying? He's basically saying, do the action um, that you would want everyone else to do in the same situation, in, as long as it wouldn't lead to a logically impossible world, and as long as you would want that world to come about. That's how I understand Kant. So uh, follow the principle that you would universalize. And the distinction between contradiction conception and contradiction in will are the two ways that you can um, get a maxim which you you don't want to be following or, or get, get a, a moral action which is not permissible. So if you think about what you are uh, contemplating doing in a situation, if you imagine what if everyone did this, if it's not logically possible for everyone to do it, that's a contradiction in conception. In which case Kant says you have a perfect duty never to act on that maxim where it brings brings about it is not possible to bring about a, a logically coherent world. If it is logically possible, then you ask a second question when you're working your way through the categorical imperatives first formulation and considering a, a possible action. Then you ask, would you will, would you want a world in which everyone brought about uh, sorry, acted on that maxim and did that action. And if the answer is, uh, let me get this the right way around. If the answer is no, then you have an imperfect duty sometimes not to do that action. If the answer is yes, you would bring about that world, then you are permitted to do that action. Because what Kant really does is he shows you the boundaries, the do nots, uh, do not lie, do not kill, um, do, do not um, steal, etc. And then within that safe moral boundary, you can then choose what hypothetical imperatives you want to, to pursue. Um, that's how I understand Kant anyway. So um, let's take just take an example for illust illustration. Classic example, uh, do not lie, because, well, can you imagine, would, um, can, can you conceive of a world in which everyone lies? No, it, it just logically doesn't work because if everyone's lying all the time, the whole I idea of truth breaks down, and um, yeah, there there is that that world does not uh, logically compute for for Kant. It doesn't register as as a uh, rational possibility, so it fails at the first stage. Uh, it creates a contradiction in conception. Therefore, never lie for Kant. Do not lie. Uh, if I had more time, I would go into more examples for um, imperfect duties and so on but hopefully you've covered those in lessons and let's try and make this video not too colossally long i'm already heading for one hour 30 minutes in this particular version and cut of, of the video um hopefully this is helpful to someone then we've got the second formulation of the categorical imperative which is much easier to understand i think and get your head around because the second formulation is just act in such a way um that you you um treat people, um, sorry, let me get it right. Yeah, not merely as means to ends, but also as ends in themselves. And I was, I just paused a bit because I had to remember that merely bit. Don't forget the merely because you are allowed to treat people as means to ends um, for Kant. You can treat me, this uh, faceless YouTuber, as a means to hopefully getting a slightly better grade in your philosophy exam. But not merely, you must also treat people as ends in themselves, um, as, as valuable, uh, autonomous, distinct, rational beings with, with worth that must be affirmed and recognised as, as, as beings, an end, in, an end in oneself. So don't just use my video, hey, drop me a comment as well and say that you really appreciated it and like and subscribe and all that jazz, because then you are treating me as an end in myself and acknowledging and recognizing me as a, uh, a worthwhile autonomous human being um, independent of you um, that deserves to be treated in in a in a kind way um, something like that anyway yeah which Kant, so Kant thinks those two formulations will lead to the same actions by treating people as ends in themselves 
not merely as means. Uh, you're always going to get the same results as if you go through this quite complicated process of thinking. If I universalize this action, will it lead to a contradiction, conception, a contradiction in world, blah, 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 blah. Right, there's your postage stamp summary of Kant, and that really was postage stamp. Hopefully just triggering some revision uh, memories in your brain. What are the problems with Kant? Well, just as we had clashing and competing duties for Aristotle, uh, sorry, virtues, we've got clashing, clashing and competing duties for Kant. So what if you do those um, first two formulations or you, you think them through when you're deciding what to do and you've got a problem that you have two possible uh, duties which actually contradict each other. Uh, let's use Sartre's uh, famous example. So Sartre wrote about Kant and said, what if you've got someone who's looking after their uh, ill mother in their home country, but then there's a war on as well. And uh, there's also a, um, a societal and potentially moral compulsion as well to do their duty by signing up to fight for their, their country. How do you decide? Because arguably, arguably, reason could uh, dictate on Kant's principles that both these duties are extremely important. So which one do you choose? And Sartre uses this illustration to try and show that Kant's system actually is, is useless and reason isn't going to give you clear cut uh, rules to follow in the complicated and messy um, situations of life. And it's actually just up to your own existential decision what you do here. Reason is not going to help you or get you either way. So what about du when duties clash and compete? Um, should I bring in, should we bring in the axe murderer here or save them? Let's save them uh, for in two bullet points time. Then we've got some very strange and um, esoteric perhaps criticisms. Not all universalizable maxims are distinctly moral. Not all non-universalizable maxims are immoral. I'm not sure how relevant this is or how important these criticisms are but there's probably people who have said they are very important somewhere in philosophy so let's um let's treat them with with respect uh intellectual respect so a, a universalizable maxim that isn't necessarily ethical i will do my best in the test would you universalize would would, would you um if, if if everyone did that if universalized it would it lead to a logically contradictory world no, because everyone can try their test, their best in the test without any logical um, problems. That world is is possible. Would you will it? Well, who knows? But let's let's say let's say you would. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything moral about that, though. I think that's fine because I think that's a hypothetical imperative, like we suggested earlier. But there's my evaluation coming in. Probably I've misunderstood the the criticism. In the second part of it, after the the semicolon, not all non-universalizable maxims are immoral immoral so what if there's something which would lead to a contradiction but actually we wouldn't strictly say that there's anything unethical about it e.g uh i would try to come first in the test there's nothing wrong with that is there but hang on if everyone tried if or let's say i will come first in the test i will be i will be first um is, is probably better because everyone can try that's just trying your best isn't it but let's say i i will i will come first in the the test that's not logically possible because if everyone comes first in the test well hang on they can't because i suppose you could all come joint first but then that's probably another way of saying that is you're all joint last yeah not everyone can come top um but there doesn't seem to be anything particularly unethical about coming coming top so does this system really work I don't know. Who knows? I think that's a bit of a weird criticism, to be honest, but make sure you've understood it. Perhaps better than me, um, so that if you're asked to write about it, you can write about it. Then we've got the view that it's the consequences of actions that determine their moral value. In other words, what if utilitarianism is just right and Kant is just wrong? You could say is another way of phrasing this criticism. But how could you bring this out? Well, let's use the axe murderer here. So Kant's telling you, according to his system, never, 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 never lie. So what if someone turns up saying, where's uh, Fred? I w um, and they're, they've got blood all over their shirt and um, they're carrying an axe. And you know where Fred is, although Fred's not in the room at the moment. Um, I mean, Kant says you can just not say anything, <laughs> but um, he's he's definitely not going to let you say, oh, I don't know. I haven't seen Fred because that's a porky. That's a that's a lie. But really, 
if if you don't lie, what if the axe murderer then goes off and finds Fred and kills Fred? Isn't that consequence horrendous? Well, Kant says that's the axe murderer's problem. They're not living according to the categorical imperative. But maybe Kant just needs to wake up here and um, uh, wake up to the world of um, consequences and, and smell the consequentialist theological roses. Who knows? That's up to you to decide as ever uh, a student of philosophy. What about the criticism that Kant ignores the value of certain motives, e.g. love, friendship and kindness? This is a bit like the criticism of utilitarianism that uh, it doesn't give pay proper dues to partiality. Because for Kant, again, you're using your cold hearted, analytical, neutral reason to work out what to do, which could potentially in certain situations lead you to a logically possible world that you would will everyone to bring about in which you are not prioritizing your lover, your friend or being particularly kind to certain people because you're following these um, these this table of deontological don'ts and and do's. So isn't that going to be slightly un unfortunate do we really want to live in that kind of way this is um there are some feminists who make these criticisms which you'll as you'll find in the cardinal haywood jones uh book uh who argue that kant's system is very um discompassionate and um non-emotional you know at least aristotle tries to incorporate the emotions as an ethic in his ethical system kant thinks you can do it all with your left brain with your with the analytical side of your mind although he wouldn't have talked about it in those terms because that's from modern science so it's 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 cold-hearted rationalism for for some kant therefore not a satisfactory ethical system and then finally i think perhaps the most uh important in my subjective opinion criticism of Kant Philippa Foote would say that he's got it all wrong from the start or largely wrong because morality is a system of hypothetical not categorical imperatives so Philippa Foote would argue that Kant's made perhaps a category mistake no that's a bit confusing um, in in thinking that reason can show you what you should always categorically do or not do because that's not actually how ethics works this is this is touching on the meta ethical problems with these with this normative theory uh, isn't it because she would say morality is actually about working what you want working out what you want to aim for e.g what virtues you want to cultivate or whether you want to bring about the most amount of happiness to the most amount of people and then working out how to bring those things about but there's no compelling reason why you must aim for those things there's no categorical imperative that is meta-ethically binding on you as as kant would would argue as a uh, i think a non-naturalist uh, meta-ethicist effectively um yeah so that that is a basic mistake in his system thinking that he can foist it on any old um this that and the other person and demand that they follow it and that they re and, and tell them that their reason will show them if they think hard enough about it that they must follow it philippa foot says nope morality doesn't work like that very powerful um and far-reaching criticism i think so what do you do if you get the 25 marker on kant well remember in 2022 i really don't think it's gonna come up although i could be wrong but it was on the paper last year so i think highly unlikely to appear again this year um, but remember if you do have an essay on a normative theory you can but you don't have to use the other normative theories to criticize it and compare it to them uh, both or just one or none you don't you can just evaluate it on its own terms what else have i said here my own view is that kantian ethics is helpful and probably the most robust secular moral system actually uh, being a religion a person of, of, of faith um, i do actually like my deontological do's and do nots up to a point however it faces the huge meta-ethical problem that its commands cannot be grounded as foot says and actually uh, if you go deeper into kant he basically ends up saying that you do need to postulate god in order to have a grounding for your ethical system and make it make sense uh in in particular ways which i completely agree with him about as it happens all right and then we're on to moral anti-realism and now here's where things get a bit sticky i think as sticky as they get uh not knowing enough about philosophy of of mind metaphysics of mind on the 2022 advanced information because they've only put moral anti-realism on not moral realism 
However, they've asked about all the normative theories in the 25 markers um, before in, in past papers and on the sample paper, which means that the 25 marker could be on moral anti-realism, which would be really mean, I think, and, and a, a bit and somewhat cheeky. Um, so yeah, if you're listening to this, any AQA uh, exam setters, uh, well, please don't hate me and blacklist me and not give me a job in, in the future. But um, I think that would be very cheeky if you have put this on the 2022 paper, because if you're writing an essay on moral anti-realism, it would make a lot of sense to talk about moral realism as well. But that is not on the advanced information. So who knows what it's actually going to be? We shall see. We shall see. But you certainly need to know about moral anti-realism to answer some kind of question that is definitely coming up. So let's talk about it a bit. So, of course, the theory of, well, um, moral anti-realism refers to the idea that there are no mind independent moral properties in the world or moral facts. So if we say murder is wrong, we are not referring to a true fact about the world. And it's usually also non cognitivist. I'm actually going to skip Mackie and come back to him because A-level students find him so difficult, <coughs> excuse me, in this context. Um, so yeah, let's talk about air and hair first. So non-cognitivism, you'll remember, and this is means exactly the same thing in the religious language topic, doesn't it? Uh, just about religious language as opposed to ethical language, holds that, well, what does it hold? Be, be precise, because you need to know that it's different from anti-realism technically. non cognitivism about ethical language or a kind of language, the view that the language does not express prepositions, sorry, propositions, excuse me, about the world, which can be true or even false. So in other words, it's meaningless. Emotivists and prescriptivists think that ethical language is meaningless. You can't pass it, you can't translate it into sensible, meaningful, factual claims about the world. It's, that's just not what ethical language is doing, because there are, it's not possible to make such claims in a coherent or, or sensible way. So, yeah, the short version, non cognitivism holds that lang ethical language is meaningless. So what is it doing then? For AIR? Well, for AIR, as an emotivist, what it is doing is giving voice to, or perhaps venting, a certain emotion about, a different, uh, about different kinds of actions. So, for example, if you say, do not murder, according to AIR, you are not uh, expressing a, um, a meaningful proposition technically it is wrong to murder because that's that's meaningless. That doesn't refer to anything that could even be true about the world. You are just effectively saying murder is bad or I feel, sorry, better, I feel bad about murder or perhaps even just writing murder with two bold exclamation marks after it going murder, murder, um, murder bad, me no like murder. That's, that's emotivism. That's what it, it thinks ethical language is doing. Prescriptivism, very similar, because non cognitivist also thinks that ethical language is meaningless. But this time, the emphasis is on how what it is doing is it's making prescriptions, not writing um, papers so that um, ethical that, that people can obtain different kinds of drugs, but issuing commands, because that's what a, a prescription can also be understood as prescribing that people... Uh, ought to do certain things, but not in any metaphysically binding way, just saying, I want you to do this, do this. So if you say, do not murder, according to Richard Hare, you're not saying murder is wrong in any kind of meaningful way that's a factual claim that could be true about the world. You are just saying, don't murder, do not murder. You're issuing a prescription, a command, and that is all you are doing. And again, that probably is linked to a certain kind of um, emotional attitude about different behaviours in the world, but that's the angle that Hare takes and what he thinks properly ethical language is doing. Now let's come back to Mackie because he's uh, so tricky. So Mackie is also an anti-realist, which is why he's on this list. He doesn't think that there are moral facts in the world, but the difference from Eyre and Hare, remember, is that he thinks that ethical language could potentially be meaningful. It's not completely meaningless in the same sense that it is for air and hair, because he thinks actually ethical language does express propositions about the world which can be true or false. 
So that's the key bit. For air and hair, they, the, the, they, it can't even be false ethical language because it's just so meaningless. It's so, it's so wrong it can't even be wrong. If that doesn't help you, forget it. But it, it's, it's so meaningless it can't even be true or false. Mackie says no, it, it, it's attempting to make a kind of sense. It does express propositions which could be true or false. It just so happens that because there are no moral facts out there, it is always false. So it's not complete gobbledygook. It is is trying to make a sensible factual claim, which can actually be passed in, in language. But because there are no objective moral facts about the world, it, its language is always false. All right. So that's subtly different from the other theories, but it's still anti-realist. And this is why it's called error theory, because moral language for Mackie could be correct. It could be um, referring to true facts about the world. But as it happens, it never is. So it's always making a kind of error. It's not as fundamental an error to, under, um, to understand it as, as, as being meaningful as in emotivism and prescriptivism. But it's, it's the view that although it can be turned into propositional language, the propositions never obtain. They're, they're, they're always false. So it, it's a, it performs a kind of, uh, of error ethical language. That's the best way I can explain it today. I've probably explained it much more clearly, cl clearly in uh, lessons when I didn't have COVID, but that's the best you've got today, I'm afraid. Come to one of my lessons, enroll, enroll in one of the schools I teach at. Well, you probably can't do that. Um, issues, issues that may arise for the theories above. Well, can anti-realism really account for how we use moral language all the time when we reason with people and persuade them and disagree and we say, no, you shouldn't beat me up and take my lunch money because that's bad and it's going to make me feel bad and hurt me. And uh, reason shows you, sh you shouldn't do that. And you're also not going to become a very virtuous person by doing that. Isn't the fact that we have those kind of discussions that people do actually change their minds? You know, MPs in Parliament debating whether a law should be brought about and whether it's ethical and right to act in a certain way and for certain actions to be upheld or, or punished in the world. Is, isn't it doing an injustice to say that there are no true facts that rational people are um, um, getting their, their heads around when they have these discussions? There's a possible criticism. Of course, they all have ways of responding to that, um, particularly air and hair are very complicated ways of responding to that and explaining how actually these discussions are effectively uh, just clarifying emotions and, and prescriptions and then working out how preferences differ or can be refined through uh, further examination of the kinds of emotions and prescriptions that we we prefer. But this this is a key criticism um, that people have made nonetheless, that these anti-realist theories don't give a clear or thorough enough account of how moral language works. And then we've got the problem of accounting for moral progress. If we, if you, if I, if anyone believes that um, it is now good and right in an objective sense that, say, gay marriage is legal in this country or um, people are not enslaved uh, under the uh, permission of the law in this country or um, that women can vote and, and go to work, um, if, if, that's, if, if it's not objectively good that those are the case as anti-realism would say, but actually that's just a particular uh, outworking of certain prescriptions or emotions and so on, then it can, can that really be so? Haven't we really become more moral and gotten better in a real measurable, objective, verifiable sense over time in our enlightened European Western world? Uh, so th there you go. Does this really make sense of moral progress? And then perhaps um, the most weighty one, who knows, it's up to you to decide, doesn't this lead just to moral nihilism? So if there are no moral facts, isn't that equivalent to just saying that there is nothing that is uh, true or worthy or um, uh, rationally compelling in the world of ethics? And actually, uh, it is just built on this big void, to put it very mildly uh, poetically. Um, and the, the way that I think th this is the most weighty criticism is because you can tie it to horrendous um, examples of evil. I mean, a little bit like we've referred to when talking about moral progress, 
but you know the famous um, horrendous examples of evil that spring most readily to mind when we think about badness and evil and wrong actions such as Hitler's genocide of the Jews or such as more recently Putin invading Ukraine and the horrendous humanitarian um, injustices he, he's committing against the people of of Ukraine. It, it, it seems that and in fact really it, it is the case that for an anti-realist these things are not technically wrong in any metaphysical sense, in any objective binding sense. It's just that we feel bad about them or that we would rather they, they not be done. There's no overarching um, superstrata or underarching substrata of, of the world, stratum I suppose I should say, that that dictates that these things must not be done. Can we really bite the bullet and say that? I'll be really prepared to say that as an anti-realist. We'll see on the next slide that that's, that's the, probably the, the biggest problem you're gonna have to face up to and, um, and argue down if you go for anti-realism as a philosopher. So yeah, it's not impossible that you get the essay, the, the meta-ethical essay, 25 marker on this paper. Although I'll say it one more time, it was really mean if they do give it to you because they haven't put moral realism on the advanced information and it would make a lot of sense to talk about moral realism if you're evaluating moral anti-realism. However, I suppose you, you don't te necessarily have to, technically speaking, I just think it'd be quite difficult not to, but you could just ev evaluate anti-realism purely on its own terms, could you? Well, you can you can try. I think you've got to really talk about moral realism um, in distinction from it. But anyway, what what do we do? What do you do if you get the meta-ethical essay? Well, as ever, go with what you actually think. I'm convinced that you will argue it best. You are most capable of arguing what you actually think, but um, you well at least. But you um, you may you may not know what you think. So what do most philosophers think? Well. Most philosophers are moral realists, according to the Phil Papers survey that was mentioned earlier, about 61% of philosophers, at least in that survey, uh, though about a quarter are anti-realists. And I find this absolutely fascinating because as we'll see soon in the uh, Metaphysics of God uh, slides, most philosophers don't believe in God, although actually most philosophers of religion do believe in, in God, funnily enough, but philosophers on the whole, don't. And as I said earlier, I think that morality can't be grounded unless there there is a God. So I would ask these philosophers, well, where do these moral facts come from? Um, how do you know they're out there in the world, especially when people disagree on them so much? Can can it really be shown or demonstrated that there are uh, moral facts? I think at the end of the day, it probably comes down to cleverness with language and semantics, uh, why it would be stated that there are moral facts that lead to certain states in the world or flourishing or what have you but anyway that's most philosophers are moral realists so if you're being really cynical maybe argue in favor of moral facts hey at least if you argue this then you get to say that you think it is actually genuinely uh, wrong in a in a factual factually meaningful sense that um uh, for, for putin to invade and and um commit atrocities against the people of Ukraine, which as someone with a Ukrainian second name, I think is um, um, not a bad thing to, to be arguing. Although maybe I'm just uh, letting my uh, emotions and, and preferential uh, prescriptions dictate my, my rational discourse there. In any case, here's what I think you've got to deal with in this essay, um, ultimately, to do a good essay. If you're arguing that there are moral facts as a moral realist taking that position, the biggest issue you have to deal with as I've just mentioned a second ago, is why not everyone seems to agree on what these moral facts are. Why is that um, you can't seem to ask two rational people what the right thing to do is and get, get the same result if, if these facts are out there to be, to be found and, and um, understood and ascertained. And of course, you could argue in response to that that actually most people do agree on the basics, like do not murder, that seems to be relatively common and universal as, as being held to um, as, a, as a common sense fact. And you could take the line that, you know, it's only psychopaths or um, evil dictators, tyrants, uh, the, and other perhaps less uh, malevolent people that philosophers tend to look down on like um, idiots or the ignorant or, or children that don't agree on these moral facts. So that, that's a potential line of argument open to you. 
or if you're taking an anti-realist position, biting the bullet, um, then the biggest issue you've got to deal with is what we mentioned earlier. Can you really say that acts that our society and um, many A-level students and examiners uh, feel, and 61% potentially of, of philosophers feel are evil, can you really say that they're not technically wrong in any factually obtaining sense? Are, are you really prepared to argue that? And maybe you are, and maybe your line of argument is going to be actually, well, it might not be nice to reflect on this, and it might not feel good, but if we're being strictly rational, as a good philosopher arguably should should be in the pursuit of truth beauty and goodness uh, this is what we have to acknowledge is the case about the world even if we don't like it so yeah there's a very quick sketch of what i think are going to be the key issues you need to land on or explore in a meta ethics essay for yourself right let's keep going um i'm gonna gonna zoom in to land now i hope even though this video is ridiculously long or already that's ethics um, covered for the purposes of this video so let's just talk about metaphysics of God for a bit now I'm not going to go into detailed revision of content for metaphysics of God because for that I once again refer to you refer you to a different YouTube video my other revision video on metaphysics of God however let's look at some past questions that have come up so we can play the guessing game about what might come up this year although actually sadly you're going to have to listen to me and not just look because I apologize I have not um, this is the old version of this table so I actually need to replace this hang on a sec okay here we go I fixed it so this is a slightly different table which I've just updated quickly uh, off off screen so what's going to come up in concept of sorry metaphysics of God not concept of God let's have a uh, quick look at this let me get my pointer so Remember on the advanced information for 2022, they have left off just the concept of God stuff for metaphysics of God. So you're not going to get asked any definitional questions about omnipotence, omniscience, uh, euthyphro, uh, paradox of the stone, uh, omniscience and time, free will and time, all that concept of God stuff, which is quite nice to know that that's not going to come up. Not nice for me because I taught my uh, A-level class, one of my A-level classes, all of that. And then the advanced information came out and said it wasn't going to be on on the test, which was really annoying. But you don't need to hear about that. Um, so what will it be? Well, they've said it can be any of the arguments for the existence of God's stuff. It can be problem of evil and it can be religious language. So any anyone's, well, not anyone's guess, those are going to be in the the non-essay questions 3 5 5 and 12 what's come up before well it won't be on the Aquinas's first way because that was last year it's unlikely to be Leibniz's cosmological argument unlikely that they'll do a simple cognitivism and non-cognitivism definition or even Aquinas's third way or that specimen so that could come up again what does this suggest to me well perhaps Aquinas's second way could come up if we're thinking of cosmologicals Maybe design arguments. On the sample paper, you've got compare Swinburne and Paley. So maybe they'll ask about Hume's design argument. Um, who knows? Because they haven't asked about that before, as far as I can see. When it comes to ontologicals, they've done Anselm and Descartes. So I just wonder if Malcolm's ontological argument will come up this year. If only there was like a bookies where I could go and make some money from this i just wonder and i honestly don't have any special tips for aqa um i'm marking for them for something else which i will not say any more about uh but not this uh subject of this paper this year so i genuinely have no idea this is not informed by anything but just looking at what's coming from before um i just wonder if malcolm will appear um anything else um Oh yeah, Hicks, The Odyssey hasn't come up. They've done Problem of Evil and Free Will Defense, so I think they need to ask about Hick sometime soon and Soul Making. And then let's talk about essays because that's what you get the most marks for. So they've done Ontological before, Concept of God won't come up, they've done Design Argument before, and they've done Religious Language before, which I think means it has to be a Cosmological Argument essay or a Problem of Evil essay or a Religious Language essay um because yeah they do sometimes repeat things from the specimen they they almost never repeat things which have been in recent non-specimen papers so what's my money on 
I think it could be any of those, to be honest. Um, I've trained my class quite a lot in cosmological. Um, but, you know, maybe you do Problem of Evil in a pandemic year, because that makes a lot of sense. Or maybe you're just kind in a pandemic year. And if someone's done the specimen paper already, you give them a chance to do a religious language essay uh, again. So I really don't know. It could be any of those. Maybe if I'm guessing, I'd probably put most of my money on um yeah on problem of evil i think but we'll see we'll see what happens let's keep going so yeah like i say i'm not gonna revise the content oh because we've just hit the two hour mark gosh if you're still listening to my voice after two hours uh i pity you um congratulations for having such uh oral in endurance a-u-r-a-l um because yeah all this is in another youtube video on my channel which you can find just search for philosophy a level metaphysics of god revision however i will give you a little bit extra um just to finish off on um essay planning suggestions as an extra bonus for this video so i've said you are highly unlikely to get an essay on ontological arguments this year because it's come up recently please don't sue me and track me down if you do or leave hate speech in the youtube comments um and just as a just as a um, aside for your own edification is worth is it worth remembering well very few philosophers are indeed are convinced by ontological arguments but if you're only here to get your exam grade you don't even need to care about that teleological arguments see the other video what do you do if a teleological arguments essay comes up well i really don't think it's going to come up but just in case maybe worth being aware that only about 20 percent of philosophers in the Phil Papers survey mentioned a long time ago earlier in this video, uh, are inclined to believe in God. I think if they do, <clears throat> it's often likely to be because of this argument. When I've heard atheist professional philosophers talk about philosophy of religion, they have often said that the theological argument, at least the modern forms, not, probably not Paley's, um, t are the most persuasive and the ones that they have the most trouble with. You know, ones based on the anthropic principle and uh, the fine tuning argument and, and, and so on. Um, oh yes, and we said earlier, didn't we, that interestingly professional philosophers of religion are much more likely to believe in God. Wonder what's going on there. Is it that if you think about God more, you discover that it is reasonable to believe in God? Or is it that you already believe in God for other reasons and that leads you to become a philosopher of religion? Chicken and egg. Um, yeah. Oh, I've said that of the agnostics and atheists is the second most persuasive class of arguments. Maybe that's because fine tuning is classed as a cosmological. So I apologise. Slight, um, slight uh, technical slip on on that. Um, but anyway, enough waffle because this probably won't come up. If it did come up in a weird possible world, though, um, cynically speaking, you're more likely to have a sympathetic examiner if you argue against design arguments. However, remember the very very best essays will not just list criticisms but consider counter criticism and respond to them that's going to be true for any essay uh i think hume's unique case criticism is the most powerful criticism of teleological arguments however one could argue it is a matter of personal intuition and even taste as to whether an analogical inference can be made in this case there are lots of cosmological arguments to know about to make sure you have revised them thoroughly and or watched my metaphysics of god video which helps you with them what do you do if the cosmological essay comes up? Which might come up? Well, um, this is apparently the most persuasive class of arguments for the existence of God, according to the Phil Papers 2020 survey, even if the majority of philosophers are not persuaded by the arguments. I don't know if it's the ones you've studied, but cosmologicals in general, and perhaps more modern forms, e.g. the fine-tuning one, as I mentioned earlier. So anyway, cynically speaking, you're more likely to have a sympathetic, sympathetic examiner if you argue against the cosmological arguments. This is a person of faith is very difficult for me to say, but if you're being really cynical, that, that just is, is the case. However, yeah, like we said earlier, don't just list criticisms, but consider counter criticisms. Uh, Russell's view that the universe is just there, or at least his famous quote that the universe is just there and that's all there is to it, is very uh, influential and prevalent. Might want to use that and talk about that somewhere. Uh, more recent modern physics has suggested the universe did begin more recent than Russell. Uh, probably contemporary to, to Russell. I don't know what I mean more recent than there. Uh, you know, Big Bang theory and so on. Um, but most recent physics, Hawking and so on, some most recent physics says it's a beginning from nothing. And some most recent physics says that even subatomic quantum particles can spontaneously appear out of nothing. So 
maybe uh, the universe does not need a cause. Has this really solved the problem philosophically, though? Because you still have a set of laws about what can and can't, hap can't happen, which may or may not be contingent, and you might need to, you might want to try and explain, or you might just want to settle for that mystery and say it's a mystery, it's just a mystery, um, as as Russell does. One more, maybe slightly more um, coherent note on cosmologicals. I've found with my students that if you group the arguments at the start into causation and uh, contingency arguments at the start of your essay and then rather going than going through examining particular arguments in the body of your essay but um, instead examining particular criticisms of kinds of, of cosmological arguments that leads to a much uh, more effective essay and a clearer case overall. I've had some students take that approach and do it really well um, so shout out to them you might want to consider doing that. Problem of evil is talked about in another video. Problem of Evil Blagger's Guide is talked about in this video. So, most philosophers don't believe in God. Problem of Evil is almost always cited as people's main reason for not believing in God. And the majority view is that it's the inductive problem of evil, remember, that's too much of a problem um, to allow sensible, rational belief in God. So you could bear that in mind if you're writing this essay, uh, much as it pains me to, to, to observe it. Um, if you so if you do that and side with the atheists make sure you can successfully respond to and defeat at least um, to your own satisfaction in your essay the theist defenses the theodicies if you side with the theists rather than only explaining the responses the theodicies Hick, Plantinga, Augustine, Free Will and so on see if you can weight them see if you can weight which one is most effective and you might even say one works and one doesn't see if you can discuss criticism of them and then deal with those as well rather than just saying, here's the problem, here's the theodicy, it works. Best essays are going to do actual philosophical analysis, aren't they, by saying, well, here's what the atheist could argue back, and here's what I argue back to them. E.g., you could do problem of evil, here's the free will defense, but what about a Euthyphro-style problem with free will? E.g., must God create us with free will in order to obtain moral good in the universe? Isn't this a logical requirement upon God? And then you might respond to that with an Aquinas-style solution to the Euthyphro dilemma, when phrased in terms of free will, perhaps, and say, no, that this isn't an external requirement upon God. This is just a logical necessity that emerges out of God's nature and the reality of who God is as a being of freely given love. I did that very fast, um, but hey, we're at two hours and seven minutes now, so I'm being fast. Religious language is talked about in another video. What do you do if you get the religious language essay, e.g. something like, is religious language cognitive? Argue what you think. Note there is an 18 out of 25 AQA exemplar for this essay on the AQA website, which might be worth looking at. I strongly suggest worth looking at before you go into the exam. Not to copy it, but to see how it's done. The sort of things that they at least claim to like, or some of them claim to like. There's no data on this question in the field papers survey as far as I'm aware. There's, of course, a split on this issue, even among religious people, you know, traditionalists, um, as I am more inclined to be, and, and liberals. Though traditional religion is definitely cognitivist because people believe there is a, there are actually a beings and, or there is a being that they believe in, which is out there that they are referring to with religious language. So you're going to have to argue with what you go with what you think. I'd say I can't give you a cynical suggestion for this. Personally, I'm cognitivist, as I've just mentioned. I like eschatological verificationism, to tell you the truth. It's very coherent to my mind as a response to air and flu even, although it perhaps gets tricky when it's used as a response to falsification. Um, it seems unfortunate to me that air compares being religious to being insane. Um, so I also like Mitchell as well, and his account seems to make most sense to me as an account of what it's actually like to speak religiously as someone who has spoken religiously in their life um, quite often. Yay, Basil Mitchell. Go, Basil Mitchell. A shout out to him. Oh, and we're done. So, um, yeah, I'm afraid I haven't studied metaphysics of mind or taught it yet, so I don't have much to offer you on that. And actually, I hadn't written down the specimen questions for it and I couldn't find them, but here's a little metaphysics of mind past questions table that might help you a bit. Um, but yeah, I hope to study and teach and help with this in the future, but this is the most I can offer you at uh, this present time for the last 25% of the philosophy papers. Okay, that is definitely enough of me. Congratulations if you've made it all the way to the end of this video. I really hope it has been helpful to you. That's why I've made it at the end of the day, to try and be helpful to some 
people out there and to my own students who um, this, this is made as a resource for. Go well. God luck in the exam, um, everyone. Uh, try your best. Not everyone can come first because you can't uh, have a logically possible world in which that is the case, as Kant has shown us. But we can have a world in which everyone tries their best. So I hope it goes really well for you and you uh, attain your hypothetical imperatives. If this video has helped you, maybe just let me know with a like or comment, not just to stroke my ego, but it means I will make more and encourages me to make more in the future. All the best. Take care, everyone, and God bless.